Hello, folks, and welcome back to English 306 with me, Dr. Matt Barton. Uh, in this lecture, we'll do a, this will be a very brief look, actually, at the chapter in McLeod's Understanding Comics where he's talking about time and motion. So the idea here is uh, comics are obviously a static medium. You know, they don't move around, literally. It's just you read them, and then you have this experience of things moving and hearing things and time passing and it's it's pretty weird when you really think about what's going on at a i guess sort of a philosophical or psychological level and so that's what we're delving into and as always with this you know hopefully with this class as we're reading about comics uh just keep in mind that a lot of these elements that are used in comics are also used uh in the you know a non-fiction world <laughs> Uh, there's lots of instructions, for example, that are presented basically in the form of comics. Uh, there's a lot of serious uh, comics literature. You know, basically what I'm saying is these same communication techniques, uh, these rhetorical techniques that we'll find in, in comic books, uh, can be used in a lot of other contexts. So it's just good stuff to know uh, going forward. At least be aware of the possibilities. Uh, so in this, uh, today, I guess it's not really a lecture. We'll be just studying the comic more than anything. Uh, but we want to make sure that we talk a little bit about how the passage of time is depicted. So how do we say five minutes has passed between these panels? Or uh, this panel here lasted for many, many uh, hours. You know, how do we do that sort of thing? How do they, or the, <laughs> how did the comic artist uh, do that anyway? Uh, we'll discuss the meaning and significance of the shape of a comics panel. So what we'll see is the comic panel isn't always just a rectangle. Sometimes they're uh, circular, like <laughs> the family circus. Uh, but sometimes they get a lot weirder, and sometimes there's not even a panel at all. It just kind of bleeds off to the page, so we'll look at that. Uh, and then we'll look at some of the ways you can represent motion. And some of this is inspired, by the way, by fine art. You know, modern art in, made a lot of these innovations, surprisingly enough, <laughs> that ended up in comics. <laughs> Uh, but also sound, like how do you, sound effects and, and people talking, you know, obviously that takes time for somebody to say something. Uh, and in The Walking Dead, you see a lot of dialogue. You know, so you got this big paragraph of text where somebody's speaking ostensibly, uh, but only one panel there. So you have to try to figure out, man, was that, you know, was this like a freeze frame where people just standing there, you know, for <laughs> two minutes or uh, however long it took to read that uh, or to say that dialogue? Uh, so a lot of interesting stuff here. Uh, so let's go ahead and open up the open up the comic, and we'll take a look here at a couple of panels. And again, I'm not going to uh, belabor these points. You know, it's not. Uh, you can always read the uh, the comic on your own, right? Uh, but a couple of points that you might have kind of glossed over that we want to make sure that we zero in on. Uh, so the first point here is is basically just. Uh, you know, we think in terms of sort of the default setting of a comic, I guess, is you got one panel, then a certain amount of time passes, and then you got the next panel, a certain amount of time passes. You know, it's kind of neat and orderly. Uh, at least you might think that's how comics are set up, but as McLeod makes pretty clear, that's not the case. <laughs> the comics, it's infinitely weirder than that. So there's a lot more interesting things going on with the time and motion in comics than you might be apparent or you might see in just a regular you know sunday funnies and I, I love this little panel here it's one of my favorites in, in mcleod here on page 95. so if you look at what's going on here in this sort of a big long panel and on the left side you've got somebody taking a picture smile path <laughs> i guess that's like you know sound of the old camera i don't even know if you know what that sounds like anymore <laughs> uh, but as we scroll across you see we're, we're reading this uh from left to right just because we're you know, trained to do that. We're conditioned to do that. So you see that. Ah, that flash is blinding Uncle Henry. He he. Uh, so even with this little segment here, you know, if we were to box that part off like McLeod does, you know, there's some time that has to pass, right? You had to take the picture that makes the sound, and then he uh, responds to that, and she laughs at what he says. And then if we can go on across the panel, <laughs> we got some guys playing chess over here on the right. Uh, so you feel like they're talking, there must be some time passing, you know, do they really just, does he, does he really just have his hand frozen like that uh, the whole time they're having this little discussion here? Uh, so you're hopefully starting to get uh, what McLeod's talking about, uh, that we're our, our mind, our imagination is kind of filling in a lot of the gaps. Again, we're back to that concept of closure. 
Uh, even though this is we only see here the hand over the chess pieces and the other guys kind of like this, uh, we can we hear we read this dialogue. We sort of hear them talking in our minds, and you sort of your your brain probably just fills in like some moves on this chessboard. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff going on mentally that you might not be aware of. And there's a school of philosophy where I think that McLeod is getting a lot of this discussion from. It's called phenomenology. It's uh, Edmund Husserl and Merle, uh, Pon Merle Ponte and a lot of other uh, big shots in philosophy that, that, that talk about stuff like this. And of course, uh, Heidegger, one of the most famous of all philosophers, talks a lot about uh, what it means to, you know, being in time is literally the name of the book. <laughs> Basically, what I'm saying is there's a lot of uh, philosophy. If you really love thinking about time and, and other dimensions and the way we experience time and being, uh, you know, perception, you know, all of that sort of thing, uh, then you might want to look into philosophy because there's quite a bit of uh, context there. Uh, but I prefer reading the comics, to be honest. I'd much rather read McLeod than, say, Heidegger. Uh, so I'll be glad to, uh, you know, get his take <laughs> uh, and let me just uh, be informed by him. Uh, okay, so you can see that he uses the example here of time as a rope, which is kind of a neat way to think about this. So if you had this little coiled uh, link and he says each of these little, what are these things, uh, knots or little pieces on this rope represents a second, and then you could sort of imagine them winding around uh, through this, like some of the some of it would bunch around uh, the bubbles. I mean, I don't know anybody who really spends that much time. You know, I guess that's kind of what's amazing with this to me. It's just you probably would have read that panel, not even thought twice about. It, right? it would have made perfect sense to you. You would have moved on to the next panel without really thinking about how weird it is, and uh, you know how incongruent I guess the passage of time is. Uh, in that panel. So McLeod is doing a good service here by saying, hey, wait a minute, let's take a look here. There's some weird stuff going on uh, in terms of our perception of time. And once you're, you know, he also makes the point in here about how comics, this is kind of a, a strength of comics, really. Uh, there's not many other media I can think of anyway where they can play this fast and loose with, uh, the, with time. Uh, of course, he talks in there about these, these films and how the film has a you know, like this has kind of a, there, it also has frames, <clears throat> like comics, uh, but you don't typically, you know, stop and rewind and, and, you know, really get experimental with the passage of time in a, in a movie. Uh, it just doesn't quite work that way as it does in, in comics. Uh, so there's certainly some interesting things here just in terms of communication in comics. Yeah, here he's talking about, yeah, here's a good example of what uh, he's talking about here. So we got this one panel where there's a basketball player and he's like, it's, it's like a moment frozen in time. It's like he hit pause on the on the video, right? Uh, but there's, there's a voiceover, an announcer saying, he's giving it his all, folks. Now, you know, it must have taken some time. He's giving it his all, folks. You know, even if he says it really quickly, it's still two or three seconds. And you're not um, going to be sitting there with your hand frozen over a ball for, you know, two to three seconds. Uh, so, again, this is closure kicks in. You imagine all this other stuff. Uh, but this is not the only way to, you know, do this sort of thing in comics. You've got this technique here. So what this means, when you've got text just kind of in a box like this, it, it means that nobody's really saying it. It's the narrator. Uh, so nobody's saying this in the context of, of the comic. This is like a narrator coming in and, and telling you what's going on in the scene, kind of interpreting it for you. It's kind of outside the action of the comic. Uh, so here, this could be a single you know, split second, you know, just like you hit that freeze frame and then you read that. Uh, so he's, this is, uh, I guess, what's leading us into this idea of these these panels and how they affect, yeah, he calls the comic itself, it's the, the panel itself is the comic's most important icon. So we're talking about the way these boxes and lines around and, and how that, you know, affects the way we uh, experience comics. You know, this is kind of interesting here, too. So here he's getting back into, like, uh, linguistics and semiotics again, talking about how it doesn't have to be this way. You know, like this little box thing here, somebody had to teach you that at some point, or you figured it out on your own as you're reading reading comics, that this is like the narrator's voice. Uh, but that's just, you know, it doesn't have to be that way. That's just conventions 
that's just kind of as a society, as comic uh, readers, we kind of agreed that this is what this would mean. And then we just kind of accepted that. But if you went to another planet where they had comics, it might be totally different. And so that's what they mean there by uh, no absolute or fixed meanings. And, and between comic artists, you could be experimental, you could do different things. And uh, we'll look into uh, some of the Japanese comics and notice that they're not, in a lot of ways, very different from, you know, American comics, especially the typical uh, American, you know, Marvel, DC, superhero uh, type of comic. Uh, although even with those, you know, I don't want to go on too much of a digression here, but if, <laughs> if you, there's a lot happening, say, with Batman and, and Swamp Thing and even Spider-Man. Uh you know, there, there's some sort of avant-garde versions of those comics. You know, if you go to a comic book store, you'll notice that some of those, it's not just because it has a superhero in there. It uh, doesn't mean that it's necessarily simple or, you know, simplistic. There's quite a few very sophisticated, very artistically done uh, comics with those those characters. That you should, you know, go to, go to Granite City Comics sometime and just have a look through the graphic novel section and you'll, I think, be impressed with the variety and, and, and the depth of some of those. Uh, but anyway, to move on, uh, so he says the panel acts as a sort of general indicator that time or space is being divided. The durations of that time and the dimensions of that space, so durations of time and dimensions of space, space and time, are defined more by the contents of the panel than by the panel itself. And this is a quote from a book. That little asterisk there means he's referencing something, and it's a book called Comics and Sequential Art by Eisner. And so that's one you might want to look at if you want to delve more deeply into uh, into comics. Uh, but if you look again, we can see how this is working here with these. He's kind of giving us a side-by-side -side comparison. So if you don't have anything going, there's no sound or no text, just the contents, just that freeze frame, versus the dialogue one and then the narrated one. Uh, you can see how those different shapes or the different styles of the panel are affecting what, basically how we experience that in terms of closure and, and our imagination. And then he gives us all kinds of different uh, shapes of panels. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, learning to read comics, we are learning to perceive time spatially, for in the world of comics, time and space are one and the same. Uh, so again, even though he kind of gets into this a little bit, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around, but there is a sense when if you're, sitting down to read a comic or like reading this page here there's some time that passes right your eyes move moving around you know seconds are ticking on a clock in like real life you know you can't just look the whole page at once right you have to kind of zoom around and make to make sense of it uh, so there's some time passing but you know that doesn't mean that uh it's passing in the comic like the comic is a static page it's fixed in time it'll always be the same you know, I guess eventually it'll, <laughs> you know, the pages will rot. Yeah, okay. Uh, but it's not really moving. Nothing's really happening until you sort of come in and, and make it happen by uh, reading it and interpreting it. Uh, but nevertheless, there are ways they can, through these conventions we've been talking about here, uh, show you or make you think that there's been some time passing, uh, that things are moving. Uh, and there's a lot of sort of artistic, highly uh, theoretical stuff that happens um, that artists have come up with, basically, uh, to help make that happen in your imagination. So it's really kind of far out stuff. And he gives us some pretty cool uh, variations on this theme. Uh, so here we've got a guy, a couple of guys, dudes, like bros, I guess, talking. Uh, he says, this first one says, I always figured Marianne, I always figured Marianne would go for Gilligan. And then you get this panel where there's nothing being said he just kind of looks glum and then on the right i guess so when you read this panel the way i experienced this and you could read it for yourself and think about how it makes you feel basically uh, but when i hit this you know I, I read that bit of dialogue and then i see this and i get over here and it says i guess you know i kind of feel like it, it sort of impacts me emotionally almost it's i mean i'm not saying it's like this <laughs> crazy reaction but you know, it does kind of make you feel. You, you sort of have a little bit of a... It's sort of like you're in this moment somehow all of a sudden. You think about similar moments with your friends maybe. You know, a lot of it's subconscious, not really thinking about it. But it does feel somehow like some time has passed, like there's this moment of... 
<laughs> I guess. You know, I guess it kind of triggers some memories or situations like this that have happened in real life. Uh, so yes, even though literally, you know, this is just a static page, but it feels like bump, bump, and then there's a lull, I guess. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, McLeod does a better job, you know, explaining this than I'm doing here, frankly, but I, I get what he's saying. Uh, but the point is that there's different techniques to achieve this effect. So he gives a couple of examples here. You could have uh, repeated panels, boom, 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 I guess. You know, that almost seems a little bit overdone <laughs> to, me, to me, which is probably the point there. But that'd be one way to kind of suggest a lot of time has passed. And this is kind of like in movies, right? They, uh, If you watch The Walking Dead television show, they like to do this sometimes. Just have these long, lengthy... Uh, panels like this, and it's kind of unusual because uh, a lot of movies, especially an action show, uh, they tend to want to move at a fairly rapid clip, right? So they're always like moving, jumping around to a different uh, perspective, a different scene, you know, whatever the case may be. Uh, so it doesn't give you a lot of time necessarily to really get in there and think about how those characters are, are feeling. Uh, whereas if, like with The Walking Dead, when you have those sort of extended sequences where maybe somebody's just sort of looking at something or, you know, picking up something for you know, several seconds, it might feel more like minutes, you know, just in terms of watching. Because, again, the convention of television uh, is to move at that rapid, rapid pace. So whenever you deviate from that, it, you, you notice it. And it makes an impact. Uh, so you could repeat the thing. Uh, you could also, in comics... And this is something that would be unique to comics, right? You could put bigger spaces uh, in between those panels, and that might uh, work as well. Now, or you could lengthen, you know, the panel this way and to suggest time. And this is something you see, you do see this in television and film sometimes, right? The, basically, they just zoom in or they give you a, a wider shot. Uh, you know, we'll get into this. Uh, later at some point, but you know you have the extreme close-ups and the medium shots and all kinds of different shots uh, in film, and this is kind of the comics equivalent of that. You know, just having this lengthy uh, panel with a little more detail there to kind of basically make you spend a little bit longer on that panel, um, and that will sort of mentally again suggest more time has passed. Okay, so hopefully this is all. Oh, here's another one. So this is kind of the a really interesting one to me. So you take away the panel. Uh, so here we have this, the standard box, and then there's one with, without a box. Kind of got a line there, I guess, if you see that on, on, the, on the corner. Uh, but by doing this, sort of taking off the lid in a way, that kind of makes it seem timeless. And you get some other examples of this sort of feeling of timelessness and lingering uh, on a panel. You know, I'm always struck by this. You know, whenever uh, in this class, when we read the first time we read the Walking Dead comic, now almost everybody says something like, wow, the, this comic moves so much faster. It's so much at a rapid pace compared to the show. And I always think that's a, sort of a strange thing to say. It always makes me think about this chapter of McCloud, uh, because really it's up to you, you know, how long that comic takes. Uh, you know, you could really spend a lot of time slowly looking at each little part of each drawing really uh, taking the time to uh, hear the dialogue in your head and so on <laughs> and uh, and so forth right um, so you're basically setting your pace uh, whereas when we watch movies and shows we don't typically uh, you know dump sometimes uh, on YouTube you can say 2x speed 3x speed you know, you know something like that but uh, most people don't do that so you're kind of more under the control of the director or the I guess the producers of the show to decide like how long did this little part of the story last? You know, they could choose to make that story, uh, that little bit, you know, last two or three episodes, right? You know, that, that story with uh, Rick and the horse, for example, that could have been, you know, <laughs> the whole series could have just been that. <laughs> you know, they could have really dragged it out, made it all in real time, and it would have taken many hours. You know, of course, instead of that, they chop it up and do a lot of uh, skips, skipping around in time. Uh but anyway, it just makes me think of that. I, you know, I wish there would be... There, there's, there's probably a book out there similar to this one about television. You know, I'd love to read that. Okay, here's the bleeds. 
So all that means is it's kind of bleeding off. It's kind of a nasty term, I think, bleeding. I don't know. <laughs> but you notice it kind of bleeds off into the page. And when I see this in a comic, I always think it's a kind of a printing error. <laughs> uh, but really, this is on purpose. It's kind of make it make you feel like there's more that was there that was just cut off. And I guess that kind of suggests a timeless, like an unframed time. It's very poetic. Yeah, let's see what else we want to talk about here. Yeah, this is just they're talking about the direction of text. This is kind of fun here for this little comic book. Uh, so you can kind of play around if you're clever with the order of comics. You know, I, I, every now and then I'll see this in a comic book where they will say, just choose the order, or you'll, you'll look at a page and it's not clear like what part you should look at first. And then you find out it really doesn't matter. Uh, you could read those in whatever order you like. Uh, but I typically don't like that. I <laughs> I don't want to have to guess <laughs> what I'm supposed to look at first. Yeah, he's talking there about those strange little experiments. The comic artists, especially the more independent comics, will play a lot. They'll be a lot more playful with things like this uh, than the straight up sort of mainstream comics. Okay, we want to get into motion then. And yeah, here's a, it's kind of hard to see this, but uh, there's a little part there where it talks about some of the some modern art, some more abstract art, and how they were trying to represent motion. So you have a painting, but you want to make it feel like that painting or whatever the painting is about is moving around. Like you want to see people on the staircase, uh, nude descending a staircase. Uh, so it's it's hard to. Uh, you know, this is not animated. It's not like a video uh, painting, right? A sort of computerized thing. Uh, so you just have paints to work with. So how can you sort of show motion? And the way these artists handled that was by doing, uh, I guess, sort of interesting things with, with lines and shapes. And they're trying to like, again, this idea of the phenomenology, the sort of philosophical, like what's going on in your head when you actually see and perceive motion. Uh, is it something like this? <laughs> <laughs> and uh you know a lot of people love that style of art it's not really my bag but the, the point mcleod makes is comics kind of picked up on this and developed their own you know i guess uh easier ways to uh interpret this i'm not not quite this extreme uh, but if you think about it these are these motion lines he calls them or uh yeah i think he calls them motion lines right uh these are You've seen so many of these, you probably don't even really think about it, but it's kind of showing, you know, like this hand is moving across the page. Uh, so that is a an idea that was carried over from these these artists. Yeah, so there we go. Um, yeah, the modern comic has grappled with the problem of showing motion in a static medium. So it'd be a whole different ball game, uh, literally, uh, if you had animated comics. And if this if this were cartoon panels where the things were moving around. You know, that's that's impossible with a standard comic. Uh, and it's interesting to think, though, about ways that the artists have overcome that supposed limitation. And one way is to experiment with these motion lines. So this is like this. Yeah, let's look at this. Uh, let's look at this uh, one on the bottom of 110. So we're showing you some different ways to do these motion lines. So the one you, you sort of start where you want to end up with like a hand, well drawn, dark. And then there's all these successive uh, successive versions of it that are a little bit faded out. So you start really faded, and then it gets darker and darker. And that kind of suggests motion. Uh, this is the one I'm more used to. I kind of think about these like comets. <laughs> so you kind of have like a comet tail on it. And, it, you know, you've seen stuff like this in nature, you know, with comets, for example. And so that kind of makes sense to you. You see that and you feel like it's moving. You know, that's kind of the only way you might be able to tell something's moving in outer space. You know, you can see the comet tail, and so you know that's moving. Uh, but if it's just a rock, you know, you didn't have any frame of reference, uh, you know, you might think that was just standing still. Uh, when really everything in space is moving relative to something else, right? Uh, planets orbiting and so on and so forth. So everything from just the simple line up to these uh, really sort of transparent versions of the object that, that's moving. And then we get into these really fantastic 
uh, superhero style comics with <laughs> I like this is a zop I mean look at all these lines coming off <laughs> and so it really kind of gives this impression that you know there, there's a lot going on there like this is a lot of motion like explosive motion you know, which these superhero comics are so famous for and here's a couple of other examples you know, like the multiple images uh, this one is like a streaking effect like you get with a photograph and it is fun to think about how many of these techniques are derived from film uh, you know I notice in a lot of the comics I'm reading these days they're, they're using CGI so they actually have computer it's not all just hand-drawn art anymore uh, a lot of these uh, mainstream comics are using computers to make parts of the image um, and they're using lots and lots just I guess in basically infinite numbers of colors in some of these panels uh, some of the best ones you know, I've read some of these comics, and it feels like I'm watching a TV show. You know, they've gotten so advanced with these techniques like this that it just feels like it's animated. I mean, it's it's really just incredible how far they've come, even since McLeod. I mean, pick just you know, go to the next time you're at a place with comics, just pick up like the latest uh, X Men or something like that. And I think you'll be really amazed uh, how different it looks than uh, what you might have read as a kid. Uh, anyway, just to move on here. Yeah, this was interesting too. So he's got this concept of subjective motion. I guess he coined that term. So he says it operates on the assumption that if observing a moving object can be involving, being that object should be more so. And he talks about these in Japanese comics and or manga. And you can certainly see this if you, I know a lot of you like uh, uh, reading manga. And you probably notice a lot of scenes like this. I, I really... For some reason, I'm really drawn to this, like, Honda. <laughs> I love the like the close-up of the dials. It feels like you're just driving that thing, doesn't it? You can really see how these vehicles kind of uh, steal the show, really. I mean, when you're reading these comics, it's you really get a love for the, the vehicles. The vehicles are almost like characters. Matter of fact, a lot of the best, uh, you know, the best anime and manga, the, the vehicles or the robots or machines, they're basically the objects have a lot more... Uh, you know, you're just as involved with them, basically, as you are with, with the characters. They kind of are our characters, but getting a little bit beyond the, uh, <laughs> the point here. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, here's a technique called, God, what is this, polyptych? Polyptych? I should probably look that up one second. Uh, all right, that is called polyptych. 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 Polyptic. Yeah, polyptic. A painting typically an altarpiece consisting of more than three leaves or panels joined by hinges or folds. All right, so you have the same background there. A moving for a moving figure or figures is imposed over a continuous background. You know, I, for some reason I'm thinking about cartoons. You see a lot of this happening. This is basically the essence of cartoons, right, with the transparent sheets I'll put over the, the background. Uh, okay, let's see. Um, what else is in here? Uh, sound and motion. Sound breaks down into two subsets, word balloons and sound effects. Both, ta uh, both types add to the duration of a panel partially through the nature of sound itself and introducing issues of action and reaction. Because somebody has to hear the sound before they can react to it. You have to hear the first line of dialogue before you can uh, respond to the dialogue. Yeah, and he talked about that in the earlier chapter. All right, so I guess that's about it for this chapter. So hopefully this has complicated your views of how time and motion work in comics. So let's go back to the question then. Bring back my... Uh, uh, where'd it go? There we go. <laughs> All right, so here's a question for you. Uh, so flip through The Walking Dead and look at the shapes of panels in there and the representation of sound and motion. So the stuff that McLeod's talking about in this chapter, bleeds, motion lines, subjective motions, uh, polyptic. Uh, look for those in The Walking Dead. They, they might be there. Some of these might not be there. Just see what stands out, what, what catches your eye. Uh, and then pick a few of those panels and discuss how they affect your experience reading or looking, you know, at that panel. How do they affect your experience, your reading, your perception, your mood, your feeling?
Yeah, just ma make sure to mention the page number so I can uh, know what you're talking about. Uh, okay, so that'll we'll stop it here. Hope you enjoyed this. Uh, if you do have questions or comments, I'd love to uh, read those. Please uh, do share something with me. And I will see you next time.